After watching this video, you should be able to describe the process of localizing neurological lesions. First, we want to start with the types of lesions. We have focal lesions, we have diffuse lesions, and they can also be multifocal lesions. In the context of clinical neurology, the neurological history gives us the patient symptoms, which are subjective. The neuro exam gives us signs, which are objective. And collectively, we can have positive or negative signs and symptoms. And that helps us answer the question, where is the lesion most likely to be? Now, we need neuroanatomy to do this. We need to know about neurological structure and function and pathways to figure out focal, diffuse, or multifocal. Now, if we put that together from the neurological history, the time course of onset, we figure out what is the lesion most likely to be. It gives us our diagnosis and differential and treatment. Now, we're looking at the different kinds of lesions. We have focal, diffuse, and multifocal, and we need to define these terms so we can understand them. And so we have focal lesions, single, well-defined, anatomical lesions that occur in the nervous system. We can point at it and go, there it is. It's a focal lesion. Often, because they're single, well-defined anatomical lesions, the symptoms and signs are unilateral, that is, either on the right or left, but you can have focal lesions that can cause bilateral, symmetrical findings, signs and symptoms. And these would be seen with midline structure lesions that are affecting systems that have um, control over both sides of the body. For diffuse lesions, these affect a functional or anatomical uh, part of the nervous system. And usually the parts of the nervous system, there's a right and left, so often Diffuse lesions produce symptoms and signs that are bilateral, symmetrical, but they can cause asymmetric findings, in some cases strikingly asymmetric, like, for example, in Parkinson's disease. Now, if it's not diffuse, we want to think multifocal. These are less common, but anything can be multifocal. These are just multiple focal lesions. But we want to think if it's diffuse before we do that. Focal lesion examples, I could draw a horizontal cross-section through the spinal cord. There's my H of gray matter with the vestigial central canal. I have a multiple segments shown here. And I could put a lesion right here in red. Anterior white commissure. And look at that shape. That's a long, skinny lesion, but that's still a focal lesion, even though it has that shape. Now I also can draw a horizontal cross-section through the midbrain. There's the ventral part of the midbrain called the cruz cerebri. Just behind that's the substantia nigra. And there's the tegmentum that has cranial nerve nuclei. In this case, it would be cranial nerve 3. So of course I have a right and a left cranial nerve 3 coming out of the interpeduncular fossa. And there it is, a focal lesion right there in red, right on right cranial nerve 3. There's other examples we can look at. Let's take a look at a coronal cut through either the frontal lobe or the parietal lobe. And with these kinds of cuts, we see the right and left. And I'm going to put a lesion right there in the interhemispheric fissure, medially, right in the midline, affecting both sides of that cortex. Now, all of these lesions are focal, but look at all the different shapes. The first lesion, I'm going to get bilateral loss of pain temperature in whatever segments that spinal cord controls. I'm going to get, with the right cranial nerve 3 lesion, I'm going to lose right-sided cranial nerve 3 function, which is going to cause my lid to droop. It's got ptosis, diplopia because of the effects on extraocular muscles. The eye is going to be pulled out on that side. I'm going to have a large poorly reactive pupil. If I'm looking at this third lesion here, I'm going to get bilateral loss of motor or sensory function in the lower extremities because of the fact of the homunculus, the, the, the medial parts control the lower extremities. So if it's in the frontal lobe, it's going to give me motor loss, uh, weakness, or some amount of sensory loss if it's in the parietal lobe. Now, all of these lesions are focal. They have different shapes. Some of them cause bilateral findings. Some of them don't. Now, if you look at the first lesion, I'm going to make it bigger. I have this funny shape. That's now going to start to pick up the anterior horn there. I could put 
this right crown nerve three lesion, get it, make it bigger, and hit the cruciferi on that side. And if I do that, I'm going to start to pick up other additional findings. Those are called neighborhood signs. It helps you localize the lesion. Okay, but still, this is a focal lesion. It's just that when you have other findings, you put them together, that helps you localize it better, and you've got to know your neuroanatomy to be able to do that. Now, why do I get bilateral findings in some of these and, and not others? Well, it's because of midline structures. The first lesion is in the anterior white commissure, getting bilateral findings, and the third lesion is an interhemispheric fissure. That's a midline structure, too. So, like we said earlier, midline structure lesion can cause bilateral findings. Now, let's take a look at diffuse lesions. The key thing with diffuse lesions are that there's a selective vulnerability of that system that's being affected, that functional anatomical system. And there's all kinds of selective vulnerabilities. If I have the spinal cord here, it's a cross-section, there's the H of gray matter, the vestigial central canal. I have lesions that, depending on what the problem is, I can have a lesion that looks like this, taking out both lateral corticospinal tracts and the dorsal columns. The, those are selectively vulnerable to certain kinds of neurological insults. I have my midbrain cross-section again, and there's my substantia nigra. Substantia nigra, they're selectively vulnerable to Parkinson's disease. And there you see the substantia nigra getting taken out on both sides. I also can consider a cartoon of a person. There we have the arms, the upper extremities. We can put some legs in here, some feet. And I'll we'll add, make these arms a little longer, we'll add some, some hands. And we can have people that have lesions that cause dysfunction, uh, loss of neurological function in the hands and feet, which I'm indicating with red here. Loss of motor, loss of sensory function. And, and so the first lesion, the structures that are damaged, the dorsal columns, gives me loss of discriminatory touch and proprioception. I also, because of the lateral corticospinal tracts, I get weakness. And in this lesion in the midbrain, substantia nigra, I get a Parkinsonism. Usually, in Parkinson's disease, it's strikingly asymmetric. That's just because of the different rates of destruction of the two structures. But in either case, I'm going to get resting tremor. Bradykinesia, which is slowness of movement and increased muscle tone called rigidity. In this third example, I get bilateral loss of either sensory and or motor. could even be autonomic if the lesion is picking up some autonomic fibers. And in this case, the hands and feet being affected is called a stocking glove pattern. And this is characteristic of a diffuse lesion of peripheral nerves called a polyneuropathy. Notice that most of the cases here are bilateral findings, and we wouldn't have predicted that the middle one would have been strikingly asymmetric. Certain pathophysiologies do cause that. So you have to be aware of these differences. Now, if we put together focal, diffuse, and multifocal, multifocal is just multiple focal lesions, and we know the time course of onset, we now can go and figure out what the lesion most likely is that gives us the differential and diagnosis and treatment, and that's going to help us move forward with categorizing neurological disease. And that concludes this video on neurological lesion localization.